Tears of the Kingdom has tons of unique bosses throughout the game. Unlike Breath of the Wild's repetitive Blight Ganons, we have a lot to choose from this time. Both returning and brand new bosses, and yes, even all of the mini bosses are included on this list for a whopping 20 total bosses that we are going to rank today. Each boss will be ranked on how difficult slash fun and the experience and environment around each boss. So there's a lot that goes into why I choose which one, and of course, this list is based on my opinion, so if you disagree, that's completely okay. Real quick, the majority of you guys watching this video right now are not subscribed, and right now we have a goal to reach 15% of you guys watching these videos to be subscribed, and you guys have been killing it, so thank you so much, and if you enjoyed this video, make sure you leave a like and subscribe. Starting the list at number 20, we have Unobo, which was a very strange one. He was obviously under a mind control mask that allowed him to try to attack Link, and this was a very simple boss battle. In fact, all you had to do was dodge him three times and hit him one time literally once, and it would reset the phase. You did this three times and he was dead. And seriously, the only reason I got hit at all during this boss battle is because I was trying to prolong it and make it longer. I thought my weapon was doing too much damage. No, it's just the fact that it's set up to only have to hit him three times. So yeah, I was trying to make this battle cooler than what it was, it just wasn't much. Number 19, we have the Sludge Like. This is just a basic like like covered in the black sludge that was covering Zora's domain. Now, all you really have to do is hit it with a water attack, thanks to Sidon, in order to wash the goo off and then attack itself. But really, after you take the sludge off of him, he's pretty much just like any old like-like enemy that you'll find in the overworld. All you have to do is wait for the dangle to come out of his mouth and then attack it in order to continue attacking it as it's laying on the ground. It's not an extremely difficult boss at all, but it definitely gives you a warm up with how to use Sidon's attack, which is really all it's used for. The Hinox returns from Breath of the Wild, and it's still just as easy and just as boring as the ones from that game as well. Yeah, they don't really do much because of that giant eye on their head, it makes it so easy to knock them on the ground, and then all you're doing is just smacking and pounding on a big blob of pig is really all you're doing, because it's just a rinse and repeat boss. You back up, shoot him in the eye, go back and hit him. Back up, shoot him in the eye, go back and hit him. I mean, the only thing that really changes is every now and then he'll throw up his hand to protect his eye. But that's really the only defensive measures this enemy will make. After all, especially with a game with tons of different fuse options, you can just keep flying in the air and shooting him in the eye over and over again, and he poses really no threat whatsoever. He does have some pretty powerful attacks, but they're so delayed and so slow, it takes literally the worst Tears of the Kingdom player ever to get hit by this guy. Okay, not trying to make anybody feel bad, but you know, not the worst, but it, it definitely takes some skill to lose to this guy. Next up, we have the Stalnox, which is still a high Nox at its core. It just throws more things at you like bones and rocks, and also it's able to lose its eyeball, which makes it a little bit more interesting than its predecessor. When its eyeball pops out, it hops around the room, which has you go on a big chase trying to catch it down and hit it with your weapons, giving it a separate health bar as well, which is pretty interesting. But overall, it's still a very easy boss because of that one giant eyeball, so it's just rinse and repeat with your arrows. Next up we have Moragia, which is a three segmented rock monster coming out of the volcano. Now this boss was simply made to set up the entrance into the volcano, for you to blow it to chunks and eventually get into the fire temple, which is pretty cool, but the boss battle itself definitely could have had more going for it. Now, your job is to ride the glider and also use Yonobo in order to blast him at these chunks of rock, which is pretty cool, but the problem is it's incredibly hand-holding. In fact, like, too hand-holding. You don't even have to aim your shots, which I get it, in some situations could be a little difficult with the glider and the controls, but it's not that hard, where this actually auto-aims on these guys for you. Whenever you get close to them, it'll just auto-aim Yonobo in order for you to hit it, and the glider somehow still allows you to fly upward, which also just doesn't make sense. It feels like it's gliding itself, like you can't get too far away and it'll lead you to them if you just lock on. It's not hard at all, and it's really just a glorified cutscene, but it is a pretty cool looking one, I will say that. Fighting a giant lava rock monster on top of the volcano with Yonobo in a flying rocket ship? Come on, it's pretty cool. But yeah, I just wish there was more stuff going on, and even the projectiles that it shoots at you is just way too slow and easy to dodge. 
Next, we have another returning boss, Molduga, the monster of the Sand Sea. This creature is still very complicated to fight, and I would say even harder because we don't have bombs anymore from our Sheikah Slate. Now, yeah, you can throw down different types of bombs, and I guess maybe just set them down in the sand, but I don't know, it's not the same as Breath of the Wild. It feels a little harder to me. Maybe I'm just not as good, but yeah. There's a good amount of difficulty, it's just the boss battle really is not that hard if you have any type of explosives on you, and it's really just an equipment thing. If you have your explosives, as soon as it shoots out of sand, just blow it up, send it into the air, and it'll come crashing down, allowing you to whack it. But it has lots of health, where some of your even really good weapons might take you a while to take this creature down. It's still a pretty fun overworld boss fight, and I really love using rockets to just blast out of the way before it eats me at the last second. It looks pretty cool. Number 14, we have the Frox, the main boss of the depths. This is a giant frog, and it's almost like the Hinox in a way, but a lot more difficult and a lot more engaging. It has that one solid eye where all you have to do is shoot it in order to trigger the event for it to fall down, and you get on its back and knock out all the ore deposits. Now, what makes this really interesting is its attacks are very, very hard to dodge. He'll jump in the air and try to dive on you, try to suck you up in a giant gust of wind and he also has two giant arms where he'll try to smack you out of the way. Once again this fight is a little lower because it's easy to cheese once again and when he goes to knock you off of his back it's not a hitbox instead he just kind of shoots you up in the air which allows you to glide down and freeze time in order to shoot him in the eye with another arrow and repeat the process. It's very easy to just continue to repeat this once you shoot him the first time and that's the reason why it's lower than it could be. Coming in at number 13, we have everybody's favorite boss, Queen Gibdo. This one, obviously, if you look anywhere on Twitter or social media, has been the bane of people's existence. People do not like this boss, and a lot of it has to do with the Sage ability. Well, your job with this boss is to electrocute it with Riju's lightning by shooting an arrow after she has her pulse in the area, which will shock it, burning it. But something that you don't realize is because with the regular Gibdos, all you have to do is do this once. But once I turned her white, I would run up to attack her like I would the regular Gibdos, and she would just still try to hit me, which was so confusing and she would crawl away. I didn't know I actually had to shock her twice in order to stun her, which caused me to die many times. And then fast forward to the battle with Queen Gibdo at the end of the dungeon, and you have a room full of Gibdo and Moth Gibdo trying to attack you from the sky, from the ground, really much from everywhere. Yes, there is pillars of light where you can hide in and they can't really enter it, but it's just more annoying than anything. You have to take your time shooting down the pillars and then also trying to get Riju's stupid lightning to pulse in the right area as it doesn't reach very far and also going to track her down and tapping A beside her. Yes, this could be a problem with how all the sages work in this game, but it's just especially annoying here. It's also annoying at the attacks that Queen Gibdos tosses at you because her giant sand tornadoes will just deflect any arrows that you shoot completely wasting your chance and then you have to sit and wait for Riju to power up her lightning again and then by that time they've already recovered from the lightning attack the first time you got to do it all over and over and over again it's a big annoying mess and yes this boss it still has some good qualities you know it's a decent boss but it's definitely nowhere near among the top 10. And yes I know you could technically cheese it by shooting electric choo-choo jelly or electric fruit at it but it's just that's just cheesing it. I feel like that doesn't even utilize the, the sage, and that's another reason why it's not as high as it could be. Talus returns in this game, but this time we have a new variant called the Battle Talus, and I always really like these guys. They can actually pose a pretty good threat, especially when you're going up against the elemental ones, like the Frost one, which can easily freeze you in your tracks and hit you with things when you're not expecting it. And some of them have really hard locations to find the ore deposits, where you're left with nothing but your bow and arrow and your wits in order to get by, which I really like. And the Battle Talus is pretty much the same thing, it just has a giant fort of enemies at the top which you can probably wipe out very fast and it also feels really cool to use the time rewind to throw his own hand back at him even if it doesn't do much damage yes i just tried to spray the igneo talus with fire Honestly, I'm so glad to see how well these enemies from Breath of the Wild held up. They're still really fun to battle and can sometimes put up a challenge, as they are extremely accurate with their hand tosses. This is still a fun yet challenging boss battle. 
I actually had pretty high expectations for Mukto Rock because I saw the kind of goose shark in the trailer and I thought this was going to be a really exciting boss battle where it just falls a little short. This arena has anti-gravity, which was really cool, and I really was hoping that they utilized it more. There's one way to utilize it by giving Link a higher jump to get over a wave that it shoots at you, but for the most part, your job is just to use Sidon's water in order to wipe the ick off of it, which only takes one shot, and then you track down the Octorok by either shooting an arrow, which you can easily get bullet time by just jumping once, or just chasing it down the old-fashioned way. It's cool to chase it down and shoot it with an arrow, and having this zero grab makes the battle a lot cooler as well, but the actual attacks from the Mukto Rock are so slow and so bad, I mean, you purposely have to let the thing hit you. It's also the fact that it's an extremely cheesable boss where all you have to do is have choo-choo jellies where it will shoot a water effect, and all you have to do is shoot it with two arrows, and you can wipe the ick off of it without even having to use Sidon at all. And I just feel like as soon as it recovers from its last attack, it goes straight into the goo, which you can immediately shoot another water attack at it, making it a very repetitive process that's very easy to take them out very quickly. Once again, I really just think it's the zero grab and the cool bullet time arrow shots that you get to do on the Mukto Rock, which makes this a really unique boss battle, but definitely a missed opportunity in my opinion. Marbled Goma posed pretty much no difficulty, but it was one of those bosses that was very easy, but also kind of fun to use Yonobo's power, which was like a big bowling ball, which you could slam through his various different marbled rocks that he would toss at you, and also to knock out two of his four legs in order to knock him over, you climb up and then wail on his eye, very similar to that of a stone talus, which is what it reminded me of. It was also really cool to have him jump up on the ceiling and you had to roll Yonobo around the room to hit his leg. Um, but at the end of the day, you didn't really have to aim. I mean, you could just toss Yonobo and he was bound to hit something. And also, I feel like his attacks were like the same two ones where he just throw rocks in front of you or surround you in rocks where you can just use Yonobo to get out of the way, which was pretty easy as well. Overall, it's an extremely easy boss fight, but I thought it was pretty entertaining at the very least. Coming in at number 9, we have Phantom Ganon. Now, Phantom Ganon actually also appears within the Gloom Hands after you defeat them, but I decided to just go with the actual boss battle version because it was the same thing but a lot longer and a lot more. This fight just kind of prepared you for what to expect from actually fighting Ganondorf, where he'll come at you in a very slow manner and swing one of his three weapons at you. And you just have to learn how to dodge either to the left or to the right or backwards, but it really had you practice your flurry rush, which was really fun as well. It also had tons of different copies of itself that would chase you around the room, which actually made it pretty difficult. But then phase two will put Phantom Ganon at the end of the hall, where he'll spread gloom across the room. And as you're fending off the other Phantom Ganons, you have to shoot the main one with an arrow or some type of object in order to take back his gloom from spreading all over the room, which is a pretty awesome concept as well. I also really liked fighting within the castle because you could actually go up the stairs and fight all the phantom Ganons as they follow you as well with their big clubs and stuff. It was really cool doing flurry rushes on top of stairs and jumping off of the balcony to hit the phantom Ganons down below. It was actually a really fun boss fight. Hey guys, remember if you enjoyed the video so far, make sure you leave a like and subscribe to help push this bar to our goal of 15% of people watching this video to be subscribed. Thank you so much and back to the video. The Seas Construct was definitely a different boss battle in terms of Zelda boss battles. I mean, we're having a 1v1 mech fight against this corrupted mech from Ganondorf, so it's obviously one of the coolest things that I've seen in a long time, but the execution just wasn't as good as I was hoping to be higher on this list. So pretty much it's just that, a 1v1 with this giant construct where you'll be dodging its attacks, throwing up your shield at the right time, and attaching different weapons into your hands in order to knock it into the arena walls or knock it even out of the sky in certain situations. It's actually a lot of fun, and I love what they did with the concept. It really feels like I'm boxing this guy and just slamming him against the ropes. But the problem and the main problem, and I'm hoping I just didn't know what I was doing, but there was no way to take off current hands that you already had attached because odds are you had some type of flame emitter, frost emitter, or even a cannon attached to your hands before coming into this arena. You literally need a melee weapon on at least one hand in order to knock it into the ropes as the cannon or fire emitters won't do anything. And there's no way to take these weapons off your hand until you use it a certain amount of times, which meant I had to keep using my cannon or fire emitter over and over and over again 
again, even though it wasn't doing any damage just for it to despawn for me to get a new hand. I was looking everywhere for a hand breakdown button or something to take these things off my hand and I couldn't find anything. To this day, I still don't think there is a button to take off your hands, just replace them, which is not great because sometimes there was nothing in the arena to replace it with and you were stuck with whatever was on your hand until the next phase, which just wasn't that good. I mean, that was one time I had a fan on my hand. I mean, what am I supposed to do with that? The Master Koga fights are perfect examples of just how to have fun in a Zelda game. This was just pure comedy and fun, and I think that's what it's meant to be. You can see Master Koga's animations of him being terrified when you pull up. You can take over his construct builds and just kind of run him over with his own car and stuff. And just chasing him around the room with your build and his build is just so much fun. Now, the first one that you fight him at, he's kind of driving cars around the stage, and he'll also put up protections, so you have to find a way to get around his car, which is actually pretty fast. Second battle, he has tons of different air devices and planes where you'll have to either build your own or use rockets to fly yourself up in the air and hit him in the head with an arrow, and then drop him down to the floor. This one was probably one of the harder ones for me, as he put cannons on the front and was just lighting me up from the sky at times. The third battle, you fight him on a giant pond, and I actually didn't turn on the light route, so I made it even harder by making it pitch black, but it also made it kind of cooler, I would argue. But I just used Yonobo and just kept firing at him across the water, which would make him dizzy, allowing me to pull up with my own boat and then jump on board, take out his other Yiga clan members, and then attack him like a pirate of sorts. It was pretty cool. And then for his fourth and final fight, Master Koga will have his own construct where he can fight you 1v1, very similar to the Seas construct. Construct. It's not as difficult, but this time you actually have to hop out and attack him when you shoot him out of the construct, which is pretty cool as well, and it just adds an extra layer to that already pretty good boss fight. But we all know those games that have you fight the same boss over and over again all the way to the end of the game and it gets repetitive and boring, but this was actually something I would often look forward to next. These were a lot of fun. Every single Master Koga fight, they did a really good job with these. The Demon Dragon was without a doubt a walk in the park, but I like to compare it to Kirby games because they always have a final phase that's pretty easy where, for instance, in Forgotten Land, Kirby turned into a giant semi and all you had to do was drive straight and push A occasionally. But the point of these boss battles are to be fun spectacles at the end of the game where you've already completed the hard part. Now it's just your time to save the kingdom in a grand way. And it does so much better than Breath of the Wild's giant beast again and slowly walking around Hyrule Field. This one actually engages you and it may not be that difficult at all, but it has you in awe flying through the skies, having Zelda grab you at the last second and then jumping back off of her to land on his monstrous back once again to take out the eyeballs just feels so satisfying. The only thing I was kind of hoping for was maybe a way to control Zelda as the dragon once you got on top of her and then switch off to jump off as Link would have been a lot better. And also it's the fact that there weren't many attacks from the demon dragon. I mean, all it did was shoot a couple of orbs at you and lots of them were deflected by the light dragon or Zelda most of the time. So you didn't have much to dodge as you were falling from the sky. So yeah, I wish there was more like lasers or something that you had to fly through in order to get to his his body, but I love this boss battle and especially the end where the sky turns a blood red and you can see him spinning down below and all you have to do is fly in between all of his projectiles and break apart his tear on his forehead for the final attack was just phenomenal. This was a beautiful ending, just could have been a little more difficult and added more attacks, but it was just such a great way to end this game in a grand spectacle. Now we move on to the final five and I was stuck on where to place them because they're both both very, very close on this list. But I decided to go with number five, the returning monstrous being, the Lionel. The Lionel is just so good, and it's so much fun to fight. And to me, it got an even more powerful upgrade in this game. Because of the horns on its head, it will charge at you with new attacks, trying to ram you with its head, trying to swing it at you when you're not looking. Yes, this creature got even harder in Tears of the Kingdom, and I love it. It is definitely one of the hardest bosses in this game still, and it's just one of the most engaging. You have to sit close to your television and pay attention to all of its attacks, when to dodge them, when to jump back, when to jump to the side, when to parry, you know, there's just so much going on, when to just run out of the way because he's about to cause that giant explosion. There's so much that goes into the Lionels, and I'm glad to see their triumphant return. 
Number four, I don't necessarily think that Gliok is a lot harder than the Lionel, but it is definitely a spectacle boss fight. It's a giant three-headed dragon for crying out loud, and it is powerful, don't get me wrong. Those lasers in whatever form you're fighting that is shooting at you can either burn you, freeze you, electrocute you, and it will catch you if you don't find a way to get yourself into the sky as quickly quickly as possible. And if you don't have the right equipment, you cannot come into this battle. You'll need to have tons of Keese eyeballs in order to track down its heads with your arrows and probably even a Lionel bow in order to do max damage with your arrows to knock him out of the sky. So yes, you can't just show up all willy-nilly at the beginning of the game. Very similar to the Lionel, you had to be prepared. But what really just makes this fight for me is at the end, each one will have a last resort attack where it will fly up into the sky and shoot one mega attack. The Flame Gleok shoots a giant fireball, a big Hadouken, and you have to keep dodging them or use the one that exploded on the ground to fly up in the air in order to knock it back down, which is amazing by the way. The Frost Gleok will cause a giant icicle storm to fall from the sky where you'll have to actually use recall in order to send all of these icicles back up into the sky for you to fly all the way back up jump off of them and then attack him. And then the Thunder Gliok will shoot lightning strikes all over the battlefield, which will also cause updrafts to appear, where you'll have to ride them all the way back up to the top and defeat Gliok. But remember, thunderstorms are happening the entire time because it's a Thunder Gliok after all. So you have to be careful not to get shocked. And then fighting King Gliok at the top of the Sky Islands is such a beautiful scene as well with the sun in the background. And you'll have to go through all three elements with this guy. And it has tons of health, let me tell you. I just truly love this fight and it makes it feel so cinematic when you take down this giant three-headed dragon at the very end of the battle doing everything you can to dodge its attacks. It feels difficult, it feels engaging. I love Gliok in this game. Number three, we have the Flux Construct, which is just an amazing boss battle that you fight at the beginning of the game that utilizes all of Link's different abilities, which is why I love it. It may not be the hardest, but using all your different abilities to find your way to reach the cube is amazing. Using your Ultra Hand to rip it from its body actually feels really good. It feels like it's kind of pushing back and you're actually ripping it off. You can also use Ascend to fly through its giant floor that it has flying in the air. You can also use Recall to recall the blocks that it shoots at you to ride them back to the top, which it propels you up in the air a little bit, giving you room to land on the big block and just take it out. I love how all of these abilities work so well with this boss fight, and I wish more bosses used some of these abilities of Link's because this was just amazing. I'm probably going to get hate for this one, and I'm probably going to get a lot of flack for why this isn't number one for a lot of people, but yes, I kind of combined both the Demon King's army and all of Demon King Phase 1 and 2 together for number two. No, it wasn't my favorite boss fight in the game, unfortunately, but it was really good. I love the Demon King's army, how it just pits you against all of these different enemies throughout the game that you've already fought, and then eventually going into the battle with Ganondorf. Phase one is very similar to Phantom Ganon, and I think that's the problem for me, is it's very much rinse and repeat. Once you learn his attacks, that's pretty much it for the entirety of the boss fight. It's just about knowing when he's gonna run at you and jumping back, or jumping to the side, jumping back, or jumping to the side. It's the same thing over and over again, and he really doesn't do much to switch up his attacks besides change his weapons from time to time. And for me, the club was definitely the hardest to dodge. Phase two is where it obviously gets more interesting, as phase one was just kind of a warm up where he turns into a more powerful form of Phantom Ganon, where he'll have phantoms around the arena and your buddies will come in to help you as well, where you'll all battle the different Ganons together while you're focusing on the main Demon King. And once again, his attacks are very powerful in this form. And what makes this even harder is he has gloom attacks, where it'll actually damage your hearts to the point where you can't repair them without some type of gloom food or something, or gloom resistance that you have going on, which can make this extremely difficult to where you have to make sure you don't take too many hits. But then Ganondorf does something that kind of blew my mind the first time I saw it. He can actually do flurry attacks as well. Even though it's not quite like Link's where he just starts pounding on you, he'll jump back, meaning you have to dodge, watch him dodge, and then dodge again in order to hit him, which is 
Very difficult. It kind of reminded me of the Demise battle from Skyward Sword. Kind of a back and forth thing. Almost even Ocarina of Time vibe when you shot the orb back and forth. But he uses tons of his attacks in the 1v1 phase where he knocks out all your partners and he just has gloom balls following you around the room, different gloom circles appearing around Link's feet. And I mean, this situation is where you might even have to just attach a rocket to fly out of there at the right time in order to get out of his attacks. This was without a doubt a super engaging sword 1v1 boss battle and I will say it was extremely difficult along with one of the only boss battles that you actually get to feel like you fight Ganondorf in the series besides like Demise. You really feel like you're scrapping with this guy and it just feels amazing. But my favorite boss in the entire game was Kolgera, the boss of the Wind Temple. And listen, if you disagree, that's perfectly fine, but this is one of the first bosses in a very long time where I got goosebumps. I remember seriously pausing the screen after I found out how to attack it and just started smiling and just grinning so hard. It is amazing. So to fight this boss, it's very simple. All you have to do is shoot arrows and you can use even fire arrows or bomb arrows to break its glass casing on its back. And yes, I guess you could also use another arrow just to hit its weak spot, but flying through and shattering a piece of its back was seriously one of the most satisfying things I have ever done in a Zelda game. I'm not even joking, and it just felt like it was a perfect thing to do in a game like this, because after all, this game was about flying and diving from the sky, so to incorporate that within a boss battle that happened all entirely in the air was awesome. You also needed Tulin to blow you out of the way in certain situations when he would fly up out of portals to try to eat you. It was awesome! But it's more than just the boss battle. It's the dungeon itself and the fact that you're fighting this thing above the dungeon that you just completed and you have the amazing soundtrack playing in the background, which is a remix of the Rito Village theme in a high sped version. Seriously, what more could you ask for for an end of dungeon boss battle? And I also wanted to point out how it's a perfect time to use the free fall arrow shooting as well, which you kind of never get to do in this game. And normally you can just glide down and use your arrow, but in this boss fight, it's like actually encouraged for you to use the free fall arrow shooting, which is just amazing. I absolutely loved this boss, and I think everything with this whole area of the game was done perfectly, but of course, that's for a separate video. But that is all 20 bosses ranked in The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and let me know what you think about my list and if you agree or disagree and tell me why. Also let me know what your favorite boss is in the game and what your least favorite is. And thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you leave a like and subscribe to stay up to date on all things Tears of the Kingdom and Nintendo in general and like always I'll see you all on the next one. See you guys.